just I'm just excited for you guys. Because trust me, the fact that as you start celebrating in the months to come, God's going to give you more conversations with people in your community here, uh, in your workplaces. It'll happen. Uh, and, uh, man, I'm just excited for you. This is just amazing. What an amazing story of faith. I'm just telling you, on our journey, this is fueling my faith for what we want to do in our mission's work. And so I'm just drinking this in this morning. Uh, it, it just excites me because it helps bring back the tangibleness as we put our faith in our God, what he can do, because he'll do what we cannot do. And you're living it. And so it should just fuel your faith for bigger things of what you expected and what you expect and desire for God to do. Man, keep dreaming bigger. Um, and so this morning, uh, it's just, I wish my family was with me. I've got a couple screenshots in the back. You could grab one of our prayer cards, uh, which looks like the, the very first slide. So go ahead and uh, that's one of our most current pick. There's our uh, prayer uh, card. I encourage you to grab it. Um, that's the most recent family picture that we had together. Um, it's been, it was one year ago. Grant, my oldest uh, son, who would be on the left side as you're look, or <laughs> see, I got turned around. I'm looking that direction. Um, on the right side, your right side, Grant, a year ago, went in the Army. And so we literally, uh, a year ago last week, uh, hugged him goodbye as he went off to basic training and went in infantry. Uh, could have done any part of the Army. He, his ASVAB was off the chart. Uh, so he could have had his choice, and he chose infantry. And <laughs> trust me, Stacy and my wife and I were looking at each other like, what? Um, but he just felt like the Lord was leading him and went through, uh, graduated boot camp in June and w had an amazing opportunity where he got stationed in Washington, D.C. He's part of the 3rd Battalion, which is nicknamed the Old Guard. And so it's his unit that does the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, um, a lot of the other things in Arlington. So they do a lot of uh, presentations and uh, basically uh, a lot of the funerals and for, the, for the fallen soldiers that come through. Uh, that's them. And it's an amazing unit that he's in. Uh, couldn't be more prouder. Uh, Garrett, in fact, go to the next slide because it shows both of those boys together. Uh, so you can see the picture of Grant. He's right in the middle of the picture uh, where he was, uh, that's where he was getting sworn in in Washington, D.C. last summer. Garrett, my uh, senior, uh, almost through his senior year of high school, uh, he'll graduate here in May, and he's heading off to Sagu. So it's going to be funny. I didn't know that half the Keck family's there um, or been there. Um, but it's, uh, so my, Garrett's he heading there. He, uh, signed uh, to play football there and planned to study to go in the ministry. So it's just one of those fun moments in life. We're so excited for him. We love the football coach there. Um, God bless Garrett. Uh, he went through um, his sophomore and junior years. He could play baseball, but he couldn't play football. He had, in the year of his sophomore year, tore his ACL. And uh, God did a miraculous, I, I mean, just a phenomenal job of healing from his surgery where he could play baseball. And then we discovered uh, in the summer between his sophomore and junior year, he felt movement every once in a while in his knee, and we couldn't explain it. So we went to the surgeon, ended up for just sadly, the ACL graft didn't take. And don't know why. And it's like a 1% of a 1% with ACL surgeries. So he was one of the one percenters and uh, ended up having to have the surgery again so he couldn't play football his junior year and uh, but what was so cool is watching him uh, just show the love of Christ through it before his team his teammates and was able to play baseball but then came back and and continued to play football uh, was a starter uh, both ways on our uh, on our football team we went to the state made it to, all the way to the state quarterfinals and we lost on one of the last plays of the game, two inches short of the end zone, literally. Um, it was like that close to move into the state semis. But uh, Beck Garrett got award for uh, most improved player of the year for our football team. And, uh, we're excited what God's going to do in and through him. And so I wish they were with me. 
Um, but obviously you can tell, I definitely wish my kid from D.C. would be with me. Um, but it's just an honor to be with you guys, connect with the Kex, and, uh, and to celebrate with you. We're on a mission, on a journey. Uh, Youth Alive has at its goal to bring the gospel to every student before they graduate. We focus on the high school, middle school, junior highs, and we just really, that's our passion. What does it take to reach every student, to reach every school across our country? And it's a couple years ago, we went on a faith journey to create a culture within the Assemblies of God to connect that to reach every student in every school. And you've seen it. Uh, you've seen parts of it. Uh, it's called the human right to know Jesus. So if you've seen some things connected to Speed the Light, we wanted to go on a journey that really brought evangelism, uh, missions, the whole gamut to a, to a younger generation. Because uh, over 100 years ago, the Assemblies of God, we were birthed as with the passion to be the greatest evangelism movement to ever hit the world. That was our founders, the 300 uh, members that came together that formed the Assemblies of God. That was the core of why we have a wall of missions, to, even today. It's a core value. It's, it's a huge imprint. So as we launched into our next 100 years, Dr. Wood, our general superintendent, in fact, made that the human right to know Jesus as our launching point. That if that's how we begin, that's how we even continue the next 100. Until Jesus comes, we are all about missions. And what the human right to know Jesus allows us to do, though, is to bring it into a, a little bit more of a current day language, where just by saying missions, evangelism, outreach, um, uh, many of our us adults would go, yeah, we're there. I, I'm with it. But to a younger generation, it just doesn't, they're there. But if you want them over the top, you need to connect it to where their generation and their culture is at today. And this is a generation that is more about cause. Uh, they want to see justice done. So if they see an injustice, they're ready to right it. And so when you begin to put it into that language, and that's what the human right allows us to do, is you can't go 10 minutes on an evening newscast without hearing about an injustice or a right uh, of people that they're set, uh, trying to say this is the best this is the greatest right we demand and so in that culture how do we help bring evangelism missions to the forefront as the primary in a student's life and the human right it allows us to do this is that the greatest human right is to know Jesus and that the greatest injustice that's out there is for someone to live and die without knowing who Jesus is and so bringing the two worlds together connecting them it's just been fun watching a younger generation, young adults, teenagers, just capture that passion and respond to it and know that they could make that difference globally done through missions, but they can also do it locally through their conversations of what they do on, the, on their school campus. And we're watching students just start to just join on this. And so we're just enjoying this. In fact, we're in probably about the last year of the human right to know Jesus. We'll be ramping it down this last year. But I really want you to pray with us. Um, one of the biggest opportunities is coming in the next month. Uh, about a month from now, just a little under, a movie will be coming out in theaters called God's Not Dead 2. And so it'll be the sequel to God's Not Dead. The, the human right to know Jesus, as it started to get out there, one of the people that it connected with outside of the Assemblies of God is Rice Brooks, who wrote and directed the first one. And he, he has just joined in on, on it with us. And so at the end of God's Not Dead 2, there will be opportunities for people to join the human right to know Jesus. That will create a movement uh, that, that helps, uh, let, helps tell a, a whole new culture that God's not dead. And so the human right becomes an entry point. And uh, we want to be able to... Uh, we'll be putting a couple Speed the Light projects up on that screen, too, in movie theaters. So we may even have people, not even Assemblies of God people, giving this missions projects uh, that are being connected to Speed the Light. So we're just excited. And so that'll be the lead. So that just gives us, as people join, it'll give us 
uh, opportunities to connect with other churches, even outside the assemblies, to just keep this missions outreach effort started. For Youth Alive, we're the local aspect of it, of the human right to know Jesus. And last summer, we launched one of our stateside efforts called Our Schools Matter. And it's just a simple challenge to our local churches is that they would have take, uh, take some moments, connect with their local school leaders, find a need, and serve it. And it's been a fun journey to hear uh, what God's doing. Just since we launched in Orlando, we've had over 2,000 churches join our effort, uh, which is amazing. Out of our 12,000 uh, Assembly God churches, we had over 2,000 join, and that doesn't take in account of churches that we're already doing back to school supplies. We had numerous of our churches. So these are mostly churches that hadn't been doing anything with their local schools. And that's what excites me, is we're creating a movement in our fellowship to really reach out and connect. And most importantly, it's just not the action of service, but it's the relationship that happens in the mix of that with our church leaders, with school leaders, and the results have been amazing. One of our friends, Dave Martin in Marshalltown, Iowa, uh, their school, their church adopted a nearby elementary school, and that elementary school did not even have uh, a parent-teacher association for it. And so the church in this first this year is serving in that capacity. So anything that a parent-teacher group would do, the church is doing. So they're doing like a back-to-school uh, family cookout. They sponsored it and did it. Uh, and what's fun is now they're gaining families, parents coming out to certain events, and now they're going to be able to turn that over to a, whole not, to a generation of parents and that, that effort of just being a great parent-teacher association and what that does to build a healthy school will go on, and the church will still support in certain ways, but it's just one of the fun parts is you're seeing how a teamwork and cooperation could work. Uh, a couple, about six months ago, I was at a church in Claremore, Oklahoma, just sharing like I'm with you today, and the women's ministry of the church took on the mission, and they created an effort called Bless Our Teachers Mission, and they began to email all the teachers in their local schools, elementary, high school, middle school, junior high, and even some surrounding schools. And they just said, look, if you run into any needs, back to school supplies, clothing, uh, whatever it may be, that we could help assist you as to bless your mission as a teacher, just let us know. And so they've been doing, I mean, from the back to school supplies, clothing, they've just been a machine cranking it out and the pastor had emailed me just a few weeks ago they had just got done delivering over 95 dozen donuts to their local school that's a lot of donuts uh, did I say 95,000 no 95 dozen so let me make sure if I I just caught myself it was nine, so it's a lot of donuts um, but they delivered 95 dozen donuts to their to their local schools is that not phenomenal and it's just all the way connected, just letting them know that their church loves and supports them. And so they're doing things in, a, in an ongoing way, and the stories just are amazing. I want to show you a video uh, as we launched this this last year from New Jersey. of Because uh, so many times, even as I begin to share with it, we think of things that we have to do to raise money to create. And some, some things, it, it could be things that we already have on how we could bless our schools. And this, is because this video really helps frame this out. So I want you to check this out. This comes from New Jersey. I've been district youth director in the state of New Jersey for the last 16 years. And one of the things that I miss about local youth ministry was the connections that you can get in the community. And so my wife and I, we were very intentional to build connections with our neighbors as well as with uh, the schools. I've always felt that uh, the power of prayer is important. Um, the high school is uh, located between my house and the, the district office, so I would drive by and I would pray over the school administrators, the teachers, the students, and as a matter of fact, this is uh, school. And uh, sometimes I would stop and pray a little bit longer Little did we know, four years later, that there would be a tragedy that hit the school. And this past January, within four days, two students took their lives. Um, and so the day after the second one took their life, I just felt in my heart to drop by the school. And as I went in, 
the, the office staff said, Reverend Kalapuch, we need you in here today. So they asked me to come along and go to the media center and uh, just be there for kids to talk. And they opened up. The pastor of the local church called me and said that he thought that the funeral home might be a little too small to house all of the students and everybody that would be at the funeral. And within five minutes, they had called the family, and instead of having the funeral at the funeral home, they had it at one of our Assembly of God church sanctuaries. All right, so in this very room, we were able to address a need that our community had with what our church had. We have this facility that can house all these people. They were going to have the funeral at a local funeral home, which is really, really small, and it was a terribly rainy and cold day and people were going to have to wait outside. So we just opened our doors. It's really just opened up crazy channels for um, communication with uh, staff and administration in the school district. Yeah, my youth pastor actually came to the school to like talk to some of the kids that were going through things and that I feel like that not only encouraged me but everyone in the youth. It was like a lot of people from my school made a connection with him and it's like they all came to youth group and I was even like surprised. I was like, whoa, you guys are, you know, here. But I was happy, you know, and I really do thank God for the youth staff that we had, like from all of us, you know, and how much they really do care about our community and stuff. What this tragedy caused us to think here in New Jersey was there's a community that needs Christ. I believe that it's through prayer and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit that you can see those divine, call them divine moments. And um, you as a, an individual who's full of the Spirit of God need to identify it and act on it. If I could inspire any other leaders to do something like this, it would literally just be to open your eyes to what's in the community because there's needs out there that you might not see. There's no greater fulfillment than knowing that uh, you're being used by God to meet a need that uh, no one else can or someone else can, but you just happen to be the one that is listening to the Spirit. So pray with us. We, uh, this last year, we, were, we had an amazing response in that year of churches rallying around with us. And the human right to know Jesus will give us, through God's Not Dead too. will give us a whole other channel because we will come out with another resource kit of resources just to help spearhead uh, the effort to help churches just do the simple things, start conversations. Matt Bodwin, the youth pastor you saw in the video uh, when I ran into him this fall, it was so much fun on the backside when you heard some of the initial stories that came out since we shot this video. Um, from one of the two funerals that, that church housed, um, Matt actually did one of them. And so he, the youth pastor, bring it because the family didn't have any connection to the local church and they connected with him and so he ended up doing the funeral and he preached just a great gospel message and a number of teenagers came to Christ right there at the funeral message and started coming to the youth group and one of uh, sadly uh, in both funeral services there was another high school student who sat through both of his classmates uh, funerals who was terminal of cancer and it was about this point last year, because we filmed this in early February, um, would have been about this point, early March, he began to talk, this other student began to talk with his parents that as he realized he really didn't have much more time left and really began to talk through his funeral plans and was telling his parents, came, he comes from a very devout, very devout Jewish family, began telling his parents he didn't want his funeral at the synagogue he wanted it back at that church with that youth pastor dude doing it. And he goes on to just, and the parents are trying to, well, we're Jewish, we can't do that. And this is where when you take steps of faith, there's just those awkward moments that happen. Just like you've experienced in the nine years building your, this building, this step of faith. You have awkward moments that you're like, Okay, I didn't know that that step of faith would cause this <laughs> or that. There's just moments it just creates awkward. And so Matt was beginning to tell me he ended up sharing the funeral 
where the Jewish rabbi did his part in the front part, and then they kind of turned it over to Matt to do a message. So the Jewish rabbi's doing all these different things, and he goes, I still don't understand half of what he said. <laughs> um, and uh, But he goes, he just kind of nodded, and I knew I was supposed to get up. And Matt shared a gospel message. More teenagers came to Christ. And from that funeral, the high school principal, who had now sat through three funerals, uh, was on a flight in May, and uh, the turbulence got so bad, he pulled out the seat back phone that some of the airlines have, called his wife, and just said, "This." he goes, this, I don't think I'm going to make it home, and began saying his final goodbyes to his wife, and began to just his final wishes, and he told his wife, hey, if something would happen, I want my funeral at that church. <laughs> And I want that youth pastor to do it because they had started talking on uh, additional ways just to partner together. They had been starting to talk. And the principal, by the way, the principal landed. Everything was okay. Um, he, he's still alive. Um, but he landed, but then later t- told Matt about the incident because it shook him up. And Matt had an incredible, and still is having some incredible conversations with him. He has not made a decision for Christ yet. But to me, the success, that's his heart. God's given Matt many conversations to just pour, able to pour out and share the gospel clearly. And, and God's at work. Who know, how many of you know when God's word goes out, it just doesn't stop? It's a reverbing, uh, it, it's a reverbing message that will not it doesn't just fall flat. God will be at work in it, and he'll use it. And so, and it's opened up other doors since then, because uh, even though that, the spiritual conversation, has just kind of, it's still there. What's neat is the principal goes, you know, we need to really get your dream, Matt, of a, using your church's facilities as a drop-off point, because we have so many students that when they leave school, there's no parents at home. We've got too many latchkey kids. And their church is now opening up their facility for kids just to hang out. Um, so they've got a nice gym. So they're opening their gym. And now teachers are coming back uh, to there after they leave work. They'll stop. Teachers will stop over and other adults where they're, they're creating tutoring and helping students with homework. So they've got sports happening, but they've got teaching, extra tutoring, helping for students. It's everything the principal knew was a need, but God's opened it up now, and the church is doing it. And it all started with just a willingness to open up to do two funerals. And that's where, even in your setting here, you'd be amazed at just offering your your facility for crisis, part of a crisis plan to a local school district that just in case, in case of situations where you pray, it never has to ever be taken up on. But offering your facility as part of their backup plans in case of a school shooting or just some other crisis that they need to get the students out of the school, that they'd have some place safe that they could bring the students to that's off the grounds. And too many times, because we have not, as church leaders, connected with the local schools, they've already made their plans and they'll go to another school, another school clear across town, and they would pass church after church that would be much better suited and quicker and even some ways safer just to get students quickly off and, and get them to parents. But they pass it because we're not in the conversation with them. And some points, because of our lack of conversation, many of them would just go, well, we wouldn't even have thought that you would have offered your facilities. Isn't that amazing? And yet that's... It, This is what's fun is this is the opportunity of conversations just like this that are opening up other conversations that what I love about it is there isn't a law on the books that can stop community involvement in conversations. There's no way. And it's one of the genuine opportunities. And so pray with us. That's really what we're believing God for through this is that it's all about conversations to help conversations of the gospel go forward and that's been part of our journey the last several years for the students is to help students have uh, more gospel centered conversations that they would have 
a, a deeper ability to start, have a confidence to actually start a conversation. How many of you know that's one of the most hardest parts of the whole process of sharing the gospel is to get a conversation started? It's awkward. And thanks to Light for the Lost, we had worked with another gospel ministry. They're not AG, but they're incredibly reputable. Their name is Dare to Share. They're good friends of mine. Um, we did a joint uh, resource that we did just uh, about a year and a half ago, and I've got a copy that, thanks to Light for the Lost, I'm leaving with you as a church to help your students. And you could even tweak it and do it with adults, really, Pastor John. Um, it's just a great resource. Just uh, they use five viral-based videos that we pull off, of, that we loaded on YouTube, that students could show, and so they can use social media, they can text it. Uh, that so there's more than one ways, a lot of different ways that they could use these videos to help start a conversation. But then we give them tools, so that they don't necessarily need the videos in the long run. But it, it just helps them get used to starting to share the gospel. And plus, there's helps in there to help them ex- understand the gospel itself personally. So that's been just kind of our fun journey that we've been on. And just pray with us because it's we're at the phase where I feel like you guys were in your building phase seven years ago. I can see a culture forming just as much as you could look at blueprints for this building that we now occupy. I can see a movement of churches reaching out to their schools and incredible gospel conversations are happening because of workers coming in taking over a classroom and painting it during the summer. Um, You know, just what's fun is the list is endless of ways to serve the school, and it's all scalable and sustainable to the local community. There's no price tag to it. You can make do whatever you can afford to do, and that's the part I, I love. And I can see uncontrollable conversations of students sharing the gospel, and we've already started to see that part uh, happen. Uh, we're, we're seeing teenagers leading out with conversations to make Jesus known on their schools. But I believe it's just there's a whole other level we can go. And we're at a point of seeing that culture form. And turn with me in your Bibles because I, I, it's just there's parts, uh, First Chronicles chapter 4, there's a prayer that um, here in Scripture that God just brings me back to periodically on that faith journey, in that missions journey, I guess for next week, as you're looking for uh, basically that closeout offering in advance next week to, to seal the deal on this faith, dr- faith dream you've been on with this building. Because what's fun is that only gets the building done, now the ministry happens. And it, so that's a fun, that, that's the whole next fun stage. But how do we step into that next phase? This verse, this prayer really helps you. First Chronicles chapter 4. I'm going to look at verses 9 and 10. It's a very well-known passage because of a well-known book about 10 years ago called Jabez Prayer. And what's so fun about that prayer, and God just keeps bringing this back to me, and he did it uh, again over the holidays, and I've just been really savoring it th- this first part of this year. And I pray it encourages you in the faith journeys that you personally might be on right now. Some of the obstacles you might be facing on an individual side uh, as you, in face of the offering next week. Because it's going to take effort. It's going to take things that are bigger than you. It really takes the involvement of God. And so how do we set the stage? How do we live that way to see God just do the incredible? Jabez's prayer is notable for that. Because here you have in First Chronicles, the whole book begins with just a list of genealogies. And this is one of the parts that I kind of loved driving into industry this morning. Is it just, there's parts, I stayed in Rushville, so as I was driving in, what made me think, it just made me think of western Nebraska where I was born and raised. And because it, some of it's the, the farm community, but you have conversations. All right, you, you all have conversations where to somebody as an outsider of the community, you could have me lost in two minutes. Because you'll go, well, you know so-and-so. They married so-and-so, and and their son married so-and-so, who married so-and-so. And And you'll be going through so many so-and-sos of how many families, this person is that person, that person did this. That's what we've got here. 
is you're going through a whole lot of different family genealogies in the whole front of First Chronicles. They're going through all of the so-and-sos, just not here. <laughs> and yet what's so neat is you get to chapter 9, here in, or verse 9 in chapter 4, you start seeing there's a moment where the author had to go, hold on, time out. I can't just go Jabez and move on. There's something notable, notable about him that I've got to tell you. And that's why there's moments when you see that in Scripture, you've got to really take note. And it should, and what's, because so what's, what's so neat is there's this nugget that God brought into Scripture that is there for us. It's not an accident. It's there to really encourage us that we should draw from it. And so look at it, verse 9 with me. We'll look at it. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out to God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. It's a simple verse, a couple verses, but there's a lot that's packed into it that I think will help us on our missions and faith journeys that we're on. And there's four things that we can see embedded in here. Before I quickly go through the four, What's so neat about Jabez's name is it talks about his, mo his mom named him Jabez because he was birthed in pain. And many scholars are saying it's not because of a painful childbirth, although that is painful. And every woman that has done that can say amen. That's not in absence of that. What he is saying is that there was a lot of family pain surrounding. There was just a lot of things happening within the family that, that is really the pain. And that is why, even at the end of Jabez's prayer, he prayed for God to protect him from pain. And it's that same family pain that he was born into. And here's one of the great parts. As we look at that in the backdrop, there's four things that, that Jabez prayed for. One, he said that, Lord, would you bless me? And that word bless in the Hebrew doesn't translate real well into English because you can't just say, just bless me and leave it at that. This is like an, he prayed for an uncommon blessing. That God, you would bless me in such a re rich way, just not a typical one, but God, doubly bless me. So really he was saying, Lord, bless, bless me. Bless me so deep, such in a rich way that it's just, it can't be attributed to anything else other than you. And it's so unique. It's what, I, it's what I need. His family situation was so, his background of, as a family was so bad. It's like, God, I can't just handle it. The need isn't just for a simple blessing. It needs a major blessing, an uncommon blessing, a different working of you in my life. That was Jabez's heart. And, and on the face of it, sometimes it sounds... Boy, that sounds self-centered that he prayed that way. And sometimes it might be hard for some of us to go, oh, man, I don't know if I could ask God to bless me because it sounds like that's self-serving, self-seeking. Well, here's the great part. The very next part of that prayer kind of dispels that because he goes on to say that, God, will you enlarge my territory? And then that blessing in that day, how you showed prosperity was really by the size of the property that you had, or by the size of your tent, it, as God would bless them, they would add on to their tent, just like you added on to your church. And the great part was, with Jabez praying, God, bless me. Bless me so that, the real part was, so that the influence would be, would be bigger. That I can influence others, not for myself, but that they could see you at work in my life. That was Jabez's heart. Lord, bless me so that I can bless others. God will bless you as you give graciously from what he's given you currently. It's not waiting until everything is in place. In fact, that's the great part to note about this prayer, is this prayer isn't happening when Jabez had it all together. He wasn't saying this prayer when he had things all figured out. He was still urging this prayer. When he first uttered this prayer, it's at the moment when he still is dealing with all the pain that we still don't know all about, other than that's why he was named. 
because his family was in such deep pain. The great thing he prayed that in that moment, God bless, bless me so that you can increase my influence. And God will give us that opportunity to influence others at our workplace, in our neighborhoods, as we bless others. And th this is one of the fun parts about our schools matter. There's so many individual ways that we can express that on an individual way to our neighbors. And it could be as simple as inviting them over um, to have a dinner. You could invite them over. You could invite them to come to Sunday night service tonight because, hey, they get to go in line free tonight or first, right? Um, so, see, I mean, they can come and, and experience your church. Invite them. Invite them over to, to you know, maybe watch a TV show that you guys like to watch. Invite them over. Maybe it's a, a sporting event, like watching the Green Bay Packers, you know. Um, I didn't think that would go over in Illinois. Um, just had to see your reaction. But one of those, do the different things that, where you can have fun. What do you love to do? Invite them over to do it with you. Maybe it's running errands. Maybe it, I mean, what's so fun is do life with other people. Invite them along. You'd be amazed how many people are just waiting for an invitation to come. The third thing that Jabez prayed for is that, God, your hand would be upon me. And here's the great part. Maybe as we begin to say, yeah, but you don't know the barriers that I'm up against. Here's the great part is that's why Jabez said, Lord, let your hand be upon me. Because, God, there's going to be barriers that are bigger that I don't know how you're going to be able to push them down. But see, when God's hand comes upon he pushes all barriers aside. He makes things where it's crazy, crooked, he makes it straight. He can make the biggest mountains flat. He can take our wildest emotions and even them out. That's the greatness of our God. No matter what they could be, it could be physical, it could be relational, financial, our God is greater than all of that. Let his favor, his hand be upon and the fourth thing that he prayed was that, God, you would protect us. God, that you would just bring that protection around us and praying that you'd protect him from pain. See, that's the great thing. It doesn't matter your family background or the story of where you feel like you're at, that there's no way God could use do this type of a work in me because there's no way God could do that and rewrite that in my life because you don't know either your story or your family story. Here's the great thing. Jabez is right up there with him. If Jabez's family was alive today, yes, he probably would have been on all the different talk shows, uh, would have been on Ellen, and everyone would be like, wow, that's a crazy story. Um, probably would still find how, I mean, I think Jerry Springer's back on. It'd be uh, Jerry Springer-ish. Um, it'd be back on to one of those shows. That Jabez's family would be there. And so what I, the encouragement to know is that if God, and here, the, God doesn't, he doesn't pick favorites. He loves to bless every person in the same way. He knows your story. He knows your family. He's for you. He loves you. And he wants you to know he's with you as you turn your heart to him. That he wants to do an uncommon work in your life, but it's only to those who will be real and really trust him. And the crazy thing about this amazing God in all of his infiniteness, in all of his power, he still has the ability to track each one of us individually and knows exactly where we're at. And the cool thing about God is he's not going to override you. You choose to say, God, I don't want your work in my life. Our, the, the amazing part about God is he's willing to say, He'll extend his hand. He'll extend the offer. But you've got to accept it. So the wonderful part about the gospel, that our God loved us so much that he would send a son who would die for us. When he died a death that he did not deserve, to die for sins, our sins. It's amazing love. But the only way we could really redeem what Christ has done is if we accept it. It'd be a lot like you drinking your favorite soda. Um, certain parts, uh, you have the lid that has the winning coat on it. 
could be like when McDonald's does the Monopoly game. It's about the only time I really eat regularly at McDonald's because I keep thinking, one of these years I'm going to get Boardwalk and Park Place just for fun. Um, and usually I get one of the two. Um, but, you know, it's one of those you're just like, but here's the great part. Even if I happen to get Boardwalk and Park Place, if I had those tokens, it would do me no good to go to yell at my wife, babe, look at this, I got the tokens. It would do me no good unless I sent it into McDonald's and actually redeemed it. Just the knowledge of that I won wasn't going to get me the reward. Just the fact that I had it in my wallet and I could show it off. <laughs> Next time at the gas station, pull out, check this out. Yeah, that's me. Right here. You know, it wasn't going to do you any good. It's only going to be when you actually submit it and receive it. To be able to receive all that what Christ wants to do. And that's the amazing part about the gospel. So many people look at it in terms of just the salvation, but it's that a God will walk with you through everything. No matter how deep and dark the tunnel may be, there's a God that will walk with us and be there for us. That's the God that we serve. And that's the offer that is out to us today. The whole heart of Jabez's prayer is it all behind it? Is Jabez realized that there is a God that loves him? And he asked him, God, bless me. And Lord, extend my tent of influence. Let your hand be upon me and protect me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today, God. We're all on faith missions in our life. Lord, as a church, Lord, we're staring at one next week. Lord, I pray for that offering that will be incredible. God, may it complete the call of what you've called this church to do. Lord, and, and it's just that phase. Lord, I pray you continue to bless them uncommonly. I pray this blessing upon this church, God, that it will be a fountain, Father, to other churches and communities in this area. The lives and the families that will be touched. Lord, we just pray your blessing upon it. Lord, I just pray for each person here today that, Lord, you have them on a journey. You've put them in places of work, schools, businesses, neighborhoods. God, you've put them in places not by accident, but, God, it's part of their mission field to make you known. And Lord, I just pray that you will just do your work in each and every heart, in every place this morning. With every head bowed, I have to ask this question. If you're here today, and you do not know who Jesus Christ is as your Lord. You do not know him as your Lord and Savior. You know of him. But is he the number one thing in your life? Are you trusting in him to be your salvation? That's what I'm asking today. If you're here today and you do not know that, maybe you've never put that, never asked him in for the first time. You've never asked him to be your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here today and you actually honestly I have to say right now he's not the number one thing but I want him to be and if that's you would you just look up I want to pray with you if you want to make a decision to allow Christ to be the number one thing in your life thank you is there anyone else just look up thank you I want everybody to say this prayer with me dear Jesus thank you for not giving up on me for loving me. Forgive me of my sins, doing my own thing. I want to do your thing. Be my Savior and the leader of my life. Do something new. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I just encourage you to see uh, Pastor John or Pastor Robbie, we just let him know you you prayed that prayer because it's one of the. You know what's so cool is you can walk up to him, you can use my favorite word, which is dude. You can just say, "Hey, dude," or "Do that." Don't call Pastor Robbie, dude. She'll play you out. Um, uh, you know, you just just let him know, "Hey, I prayed that prayer." And what's fun is you've got people that love to do life with you. Um, I mean, it, that that's what I love about the Kex is 
from day one, I met Pastor John at a camp in Iowa. That's the type of guy he is. And I just encourage you to let him know that you prayed that prayer. There's no embarrassment to it. In fact, it's a celebrating thing. That's a party thing. Um, so make sure that you do that today. And I just want, before I turn back, can I just pray one more prayer of blessing upon this church for you? And I'll turn it over. Heavenly Father, I thank you. God, I just marvel at the faith of this church. Lord, I'm just so excited because, God, you have brought from things, from a dream, you've brought them to a point where, God, it's realized. And, God, may the greatest days, the greatest days for industry assembly are not written in the past, and they're not just written at a moment when this all the bills are paid. But, God, it's in the future. The greatest days are families that are going to come to Christ because they marvel at this church building. They'll marvel at the lives that are being changed, the stories that are coming out. Lord, I pray the greatest dreams, the greatest days for this church are yet ahead. And God, I pray you continue to bring the people and the resources, God, that you want to bring into this church to, to accomplish the dreams that you have purposed for this church. Lord, the greatest days are ahead. I pray your blessing upon in Jesus' wonderful name. you've been blessed today. You've heard a good word and hopefully you've been encouraged and God's going to continue to do good things. I'm going to give you a moment to get back to your table so if anybody has some questions, please feel free to greet our missionary. But I always say this, share the missionary. If you can get engaged in the next 20 minute conversation and nobody else gets to shake his hand, shame on you. Alright? Share the missionary is always good advice. Alright. We're glad you're here. Somebody asked me, well, what, if we, what are we going to do if we, if we raise more money than $10,000? For one, we'll worry about that when it gets here. But one of the things that we will need to do, you know how we're going to continue to have projects. We'd, we'd like to, you know, some of the things were not on our list to do. Uh, and we've done m way more than what we had anticipated when we started this project. But if you're in this room and you're, are you aware of the sound? Anybody hear that sound, that distracting sound? Uh, we've, we've put in insulation to deaden the sound of the rain. Uh, but every time that, that it gets colder or heats up throughout the day, it contracts and it makes that noise. That's what you're hearing. Uh, it's not wind blowing through the rafters or anything like that. Uh, but the only way for that sound to go away is for the next step, which is to put in a suspended ceiling. Uh, and I have, we've not ever priced that or anything. We need to have that done and just see where we're going to be. So but that will probably be one of the next projects or first projects that we take on once we're done to just, you know, make it so it's a, a little more. And it's so distracting. I don't know if it bothers you, but when I'm preaching, it bothers me. When I'm not preaching, it really bothers me. So, uh, so today in, in having that, it's like, oh, my goodness. I don't know how you guys put up with that. So, anyway, well, let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for Pastor Kent and for bringing him to this service on this day.